Welcome to another episode of Life Imitating Movies, a weekly podcast for myself and my co-host Brad. We talk about news stories from across the internet from the past week and the movies that we think have already been made that resemble these recurring real-life events. So, Brad, how are you doing this week? Anything new going on? Anything at all? No, nah, dude, I'm doing all right. It was a standard week. Absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, such is life even before this pandemic. Sometimes you just have slow down weeks where nothing really of significance happens. So maybe next week, maybe maybe then. So let's just get right into it. As host this week, kind of playing host, the question I posed for both of us kind of has to do with movies, but it's still an interesting question that might get people talking where I asked the question, what is the worst movie date that you've been on? And we've all been there. We've all had bad dates. We've all had bad dates where we went to the movies with someone. So we all have these stories. So if you want to go first or if you want me to go first, either way, I'm sure it'll be an entertaining story. I, I guess I could take it. Yeah, The first, it was like one of my first movie dates was I went and saw Nutty Professor 2, The Clumps. Um and it was a girl I met, really interested in everything. Went to the movies. My buddies decided to also go to the movies and sit a couple rows behind us. And so apparently my leg would not stop shaking. And you know me. You know I can't stop moving. You've even said in this podcast, I don't know, I probably edited it out, but I rock in my chair all the time. And you're like, dude, stop doing that. Come on. But like, I just can't stop moving. But this was like my first kind of movie date, and my my right leg was just a mile a minute, dude, like Thumper from Bambi, dude. I could not stop, not stop going. And my buddies, my buddies to this day still make fun of me, still still call me Shakes a lot because because of that single moment. Well, if that was the worst thing that happened, you know, it doesn't sound quite as bad as, as people who have gotten sick on dates and just crazier things have happened. So certainly embarrassing, but. Come on, that, that first movie date that you go on, it's always a nerve-wracking experience, no matter who you are, no matter if you're a guy, girl, whatever. It's just always a, a really nervous, awkward experience, that first movie date that you go on. Yeah, dude. I mean, there. yeah, I can't think of any horrible one. I mean, I, I, there were a couple of them where I saw a horror movie with a girl, and she like was doing this the whole time with the movie, and I'm sitting there like, cool all right you should have told me you don't like horror movies if you were gonna do you know but like no 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 crazy embarrassing stories really that's fair so for mine this was freshman year of college and this girl that i had a crush on at the time we went out to go see the movie black swan with natalie portman and in hindsight, that may not have been the best date movie, especially first date movie. So th the story goes, you know, I, I pick her up kind of at her dorm and we take public transport, public transport into the city, into Philadelphia. And we try and find the theater that's at because we didn't go to kind of a mainstream theater because when this came out, it was kind of like an artsy, kind of an art house movie, Black Swan. It got obviously some releases in main theaters, but main, mainstream theaters, but obviously this was more of a artsy kind of movie. So we're trying to navigate to this kind of art house movie theater that it's playing at in the city. And that took some navigating and that was an experience. So already we're off to a bad start there. But once we get there, buy the tickets, you get in there, get some good seats. And once the movie starts, she had been kind of chewing this piece of gum that she asked me to hold on to for a little bit of the first part of the movie. And I'm like, OK, that's probably a good sign, I guess, that she feels comfortable kind of saying like, hey, uh, this piece of gum that was in my mouth, can you hold this? And the problem was she forgot that she had asked me because she was tending to something else in her purse, you know, where she kind of forgot about the gum. Hence, she wanted me to hold it in the first place. So I'm sitting there for, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes just holding on to this piece of gum. And it's just this awkward situation where I didn't want to kind of bring it up. And I did, wasn't sure if she had forgotten or what. It was just, again, it's an awkward first date kind of atmosphere. And then you have the movie playing. So you don't want to have a a full on conversation. So I'm sitting there forever holding this piece of gum. And finally I whispered to her about it and bring it back up. And she says, Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot. And you know, just kind of like 
tosses it, uh, you know, in a napkin, like in a trash can on the side of the, the aisle there. And then, you know, to add on to it, like I said, Black Swan, not really a great first date movie. There are some scenes in there where not only is it a very psychological movie with Natalie Portman and she's maybe going a little bit crazy and it's a little bit dramatic, but there are some very intimate scenes in there as well, especially the scene between her and Mila Kunis in the movie. So watching that on a first date, not really the best. And then to cap it off, we took the public transport again back to campus from the city. And, you know, like like every other guy, I'm kind of planning on a kind of kiss goodnight and walking her back to her dorm. And when we get back to her dorm, there's a group of people hanging out right outside the entrance to her hallway. And one of the people is a guy, which is a friend of mine that I know also kind of has a crush on her. So needless to say, that didn't kind of really happen. And it just it was a super awkward experience. So not a horrific story, I guess, but still one that's kind of burned in my memory that, yeah, this is probably one of the not as good movie dates that I've been on. All right. So two questions. One, was she not able to chew gum and look through her purse or something? Like, why did she need you to hold the gum? Honestly, I, I can't really remember. Like I said, I think she was just preoccupied with something and just I can't remember the exact reason why she wanted me to hold on to it for a second. Uh, you know, this was, like I said, freshman year of college. So we're talking about 12 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. So I can't really tell you for sure. But again, it was just it was supposed to be a temporary thing. And then it became a how long do I hold on to this type of thing? Yeah, I've never had a situation where I was like, I got to make a phone call. Hold my gum. But, so two was, was there a second date? Sort of, but not really. And that, that's a longer <laughs> story for another day. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll tell you offline. But let's, let's get into our stories from the week here. So our first story from this week is President Barack Obama was on a late night talk show this week and was asked to kind of clarify some of these videos that have been coming out about these UFO leaked Navy videos that have been gaining more and more traction and you start to see more of in recent times here. And he said, frankly, we don't know what they are. And there are a number of explanations. You know, some people just immediately jump towards aliens, but it's still a fascinating story when you look at, look at it about what these things could be when you watch some of these videos and the fact that publicly, at least, the U.S. government is saying they don't know what they are. So this is really a fascinating story. And I know you are really a big fan of space related stories and extraterrestrial life, possibly. So what did you think when you saw some of this? Uh, it just made me think, I mean, because I, I, I'm, I'm one of those crazies. I believe I've seen a UFO. I believe I've seen two UFOs in my life. One time I was driving down the street. I saw in the sky six lights in a big circle that were spinning, and each individual light was spinning individually. And then it was gone. So that's one. Two was I saw four red lights very close together, looked up, thing moved insanely fast, and then was gone. I believe those to be two UFO sightings that I've had. So it's certainly open to interpretation and whatever you choose to believe or what you've seen or any such thing like that. So obviously this is still ongoing and we could see more videos. We could see more kind of things develop about this story. So tune in and, and see where this goes. I mean, I, I, I like that, the you know, it's, these stories are very interesting to me. I love, I love that they're coming out. I love that they're coming from high level people. It's not like the crazies who say they've seen a UFO, you know, like I just did, but it's like high level government people, you know, Obama, obviously the president or whatever coming out. These videos are coming out. They're not being debunked. The only thing is it doesn't seem like they're getting as big as they should be. Like these stories seem to be absolute proof that something has come to visit our planet, almost absolute proof of alien life. Maybe, maybe I see it that way. Maybe you don't, I'm not sure we'll get to that, but it's like, I feel like these stories should be bigger. Cause it's like, to me, it's like, it's proof, man. It's proof that aliens have visited our planet. 
Well, look, some of the explanations that have also been thrown out is that it could be a secret U.S. government project, a defense project that they're not publicly disclosing, that they're playing the, the card where they don't know what it is, but it's something they're working on that people have cited. It could be the same sort of thing for another country, an experimental technology. We don't know for sure. It could just be other things where, again, aliens maybe aren't the first the first step of the discussion for something like this, but... Who knows? So let's get into the movies here. Obviously, if you do think it's aliens, like the you know, the meme of the guy on the History Channel, I'm not saying it's aliens, but aliens. So obviously, you probably picked a movie relating to extraterrestrial life and to aliens, right? I did, but I even went more specific to the article because in this movie, Independence Day, um the guy, the president, they're on the plane, right? And the, and the guy says, sir, I assure you, if Area 51 was a real place, I would know about it. And then his, his secretary of defense, I believe it is, he says, Mr. President, that's not exactly true. And like that scene is what it reminded me of, where it's like Obama's like, I would know if we, if we had aliens somewhere. And then it's like, you know, maybe the president doesn't always know everything. It's certainly a possibility, and we've covered this movie a little bit on a previous episode, so we won't dwell too long on it, but I know when we've talked about it before, I had a lot of positive things to say about it, so did you, and rightfully so, because I think this is a movie that just gets a, balances a bunch of different tones correctly and just has a really good mix of acting and effects and an original story and massive spaceships, so this is still a movie that... I'm sure you watch every 4th of July. It's on your calendar. But this is still a movie that I very much enjoy. Yeah. I need to get a better memory. I legitimately don't remember covering this movie on here. (laughs) But it is a great movie. I do watch it every July 4th. There you go. So the movie I picked, and I, I, I'm i struggling a little bit like you as well, where I'm not sure if we discussed this on the show before, because I think you might have bought it up, or maybe we touched on it, but didn't use it relating to an article. But the movie that I picked related to this story, and you're going to laugh, is the movie Phoenix Forgotten. And the reason I picked this one is because you've been wanting me to watch this movie for a while. It was on a list of recommended movies that you sent to me a few years back that had a lot of different kind of alien and extraterrestrial movies on it. And I finally got around to seeing this particular movie, Phoenix Forgotten, not too, too long ago. And I was not impressed. I I just felt it was like every other found footage movie out there. And it is a found footage movie, but the fact that it was made in 2017 gave me a little hope because when you had these wave of found footage movies that came out in the mid-2000s, probably piggybacking on the success of the first Paranormal Activity. Those were just being churned out. They weren't great quality. It was pretty bad acting, budget, whatever it was. And this one, again, made in 2017, I had a little bit higher expectations for it. But at the end of the day, I just felt like it was like every other found footage movie, that not that much happened. It was really simple, really low budget, and there was so much more they could have done with it, considering how it started, because I did like the premise and how they got into the movie, but then the whole second and third act was not that great for me. Yeah, dude, this was one I went into not expecting anything. I Kind of exact opposite uh, expectations in you, which maybe flavored our opinions of the movie, because... For me, I, going into a found footage movie, I was like, ah, eh, this is just going to be some garbage. And I watched it. I loved the way it opened because the Phoenix lights in the sky from like 95, I believe, it's like, it's a true story. though. That's like one of the most famous alien sightings ever. And so I really loved the way it started. I love I the story of them going to Area 51 and being chased by the, the people. And, and then it just, and the ending I thought was phenomenal. I just... That one for me was like a massive surprise in terms of just how much I enjoyed it. So I think like you always say, we'll just agree to disagree because I thought it was just super mediocre and that it was just another found footage movie that just blends into all the rest that doesn't really do anything particularly different or exciting or new. So 
let's just move on. All right, so my first story, I'm going to start it off on the on the sad note, which was a comedy legend. Charles Grodin passed away this week. Another comedy legend, uh, uh, Paul Mooney, also passed away. But um, Charles Grodin, for me, I was a massive fan. Um, but, uh, you know, I wanted to I, – I, I brought this in the article because I wanted to know for you, you know, in later years he wasn't as a household name. So I was wondering with you – did you know who Charles Grodin was like before the headlines came out? Were you familiar with his work? Did you, had you seen any of his movies or maybe when I sent you this story and the headlines came out, is that only when you kind of look back at his work? Sure. So I'll be honest, I'm familiar with the name. I knew who he was. And if you asked me before his death, if I could name some things that he had been in, I probably wouldn't have been able to. And also in researching for this story, when I looked at the movies that movies and TV shows that he's been in, honestly, I haven't really seen too many of them, if any. So I certainly knew the name. I certainly knew that he commanded respect, but I didn't really know too much of what he starred in. Right on. I, I mean, yeah. My movie pick would be the first movie I ever saw with him in. I'll get to that in a second. But it's, I remember years ago, dude, I was on like a YouTube kick and I just went down a probably an hour, hour and a half rabbit hole of watching all of his talk show appearances because Groden, as famous as he was for his movies and his performances, he was almost even more famous for his talk show appearances on Carson and Letterman, where he played this curmudgeon character. And if you ever want to watch one of the single funniest talk show interviews ever watch Charles Grodin's interview with Johnny Carson from 1990. It, it, I rewatched it again the other day. It, it is one of the funniest 20 minutes or 15 minutes you'll ever see. It is one of the best late night interviews ever. That's fair. So where did, did you go for picking a movie related to this story? So the first movie I ever saw with Charles Grodin in it, which made me like fall in love with the dude was a movie called Clifford with Martin Short. And it's Martin Short plays uh, uh, a little kid in the movie who's a rambunctious, you know, kind of a-hole little kid. And Groden plays his uncle who's trying to impress his girlfriend with the fact that he loves kids. But Clifford is a little psycho. And and so this curmudgeonly character that Charles Groden is like they go they butt heads against each other. And for me, that's like in terms of like movies from my childhood that I still love to this day. Clifford is it. And I, I rewatched it again the day he passed away because I hadn't seen it so long and it holds up. It is such a, it's a comedy classic, I'd say. Well, I certainly think, unfortunately, given his death, that some of his work might have some more traction now with modern audiences where maybe they track down some of these movies and give them a watch because, unfortunately, we've talked about this before on the show where we're living in an age where with streaming services, not a lot of this older stuff is available. It's a lot of movies and shows that were just released in the last 10, 20 years that if you're looking to go back further for an older actor that has recently died like this and you're trying to find movies from the 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe even 80s, that there aren't too many on these all these different streaming platforms for as many as we have these days. So May, might be a little bit hard to track down, but you would still definitely recommend it for people to see. Yeah, dude, Clifford is, it's its one of the funniest movies ever. Martin Short is an idol of mine. I, I love Martin Short like like almost none other. And so his performance in that, he's just, he plays like a a little a-hole. There's no other way to describe it. He plays a little a-hole in the movie. And, and him versus Charles Grodin's curmudgeonly uncle, it is like the perfect matchup, man. And it's if if you have the chance to try, I don't know if it's on streaming services right now or not. I have the DVD, obviously. It's it's worth your time, even as an adult. It's worth your time just to see great comedy. That's fair. So, like I said, unfortunately, I wasn't really too familiar with his catalog. So, in looking up some of the movies that he's been in, honestly, there weren't that many, if any, that I had seen. So. Famously, one of his more well-known projects that he starred in was The Heartbreak Kid. And that was the original kind of one because the movie that I picked related to this story is the 2007 remake of that movie, The Heartbreak Kid, starring Ben Stiller. So that was as close as I could come to this, unfortunately. But 
it's still an interesting movie. It's still one of these, I would almost say a forgettable comedy where I wouldn't call it a classic. I wouldn't call it the funniest movie I've ever seen, but I wouldn't call it the worst. So it, it is exactly what I said. It's a forgettable comedy. It was enjoyable when I saw it. I think I've just seen it on TV, just on cable and kind of seen it through from start to finish on there. But it was enjoyable. That That's all I have to say about it, really. Yeah, it's one of those one of those movies that just comes along. You've seen it. It was funny. You forget about it. I mean, it does have a solid cast. Of, it's Marlon Ackerman, Michelle Monaghan. I think Danny McBride is in it, too, which I love Danny McBride. And, you know, when you go down the Ben Stiller, you know, you do a Ben Stiller marathon, you'll throw a heartbreak kid. It's a, it's, a, it's a good way to spend an hour and a half. Yeah, and Heartbreak Kid is definitely kind of up Ben Stiller's alley where he plays one of these kind of quiet, conservative, a little bit characters and just wacky stuff happens to him that he has to endure and work his way through and it just kind of snaps him. So I feel like that's a role that he's played a lot in his career and this definitely fits the bill for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't seen that movie in a while. I'm going to have to give it a rewatch because I'll be honest, I... I didn't really, I, 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 you'd seen Heartbreak Kid mentioned a lot over the last couple, you know, days since he's passed. I didn't even put it together that, that that was the remake of the Charles Grodin movie. Maybe that speaks to how forgettable it is. There you go. Perfect way to sum it up. So another huge story from this past week, obviously, has been the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So... <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to talk about that. That is a very hot button subject. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, it took you by surprise with that one. So instead, <laughs> we're going to talk about Burger King bringing back their crown shaped chicken nuggets. So I'm sure this was a story that you really liked that you I was surprised that you hadn't bought this up, that this wasn't a story that you saw and said, wow, I want to talk about this because I enjoy talking about these fast food trends and the latest news and that kind of stuff happening. So I'm sure you're very excited by this. First off, I'm almost positive you just called me fat and insulted me quite harshly right there, but it's okay. I forgive you. Um, yeah, when I, saw this, when I saw this this story in your list, I said he must have seen this headline and, and had like the perfect movie right away pop into his head for you, for you to pick a, a food story. I feel like you, you knew exactly what movie you, you wanted to pick. Well, I think when you're talking about a food-related story, there's a lot of directions that you can go. And especially with these crown-shaped nuggets, that's kind of more the direction that I went in. I'll get into my pick in a second. But I felt like this was still a story that, while interesting, that people see and say, oh, maybe I'll try those when they come out, that there were a lot of different movies that could be related to this story. Yeah, I mean, you read the story and it's just like, it's just the chicken nugget. It's the exact chicken nugget that they have, only it's crown shaped. Ooh. And it's like, it made me think of like, you know, the McRib. You know, when the McRib comes back, everybody's like, holy crap, I gotta get the McRib. And then you have the McRib and you're like, it's really, it really isn't that good. But being the person I am, I still buy like 30 of them when they're around because it's a limited time only. You know, I, can't, I can't let that, that opportunity pass me by. Well, like they mentioned, maybe it'll make for some interesting dipping kind of positions and uh, abilities than their regular nuggets. So let's get into the, the movies here. So where did you kind of go? It sounds like maybe you went a little more food related, related to the story about chicken nuggets. <laughs> I went food related in that I picked one of the most famous scenes in movie history is the scene from Pulp Fiction where... Um, Sam Jackson goes into the place to, to, to get these people. And, uh, you know, before he gives his whole Ezekiel speech and he says, uh, the guys are sitting at the table and they have the big kahuna burgers and they they all have their big kahuna burgers. And he picks up the burger and he eats it. And he's like, mm, that is a tasty burger. So, you know, that's where I went with it. He eats a big kahuna burger before he, you know, assassinates five people. Yeah, I don't believe we've covered this movie on the show yet. So obviously Pulp Fiction, very famous movie, classic. A lot of people would probably put it in their top 10 that are movie buffs and really love that sort of thing. So where would you put Quentin Tarantino in terms of your favorite director these days? Where would you put 
his work kind of compared to some of the other directors you really like? Uh, he's a top five without a doubt, probably top three, if I'm being honest with you. Uh, I absolutely love Tarantino. I buy, I own all of his scripts. I buy them as soon as they get released. Uh, Pulp Fiction, as genius, it's not even my favorite Tarantino movie. His, his first directed movie, Reservoir Dogs, is my favorite. But Pulp Fiction is, it's a flat out masterpiece, man. It should have, it should have won Best Picture that year. I believe that's the year it went to Forrest Gump. Um, which another great movie, but I think Pulp Fiction should have taken it. Yeah, Pulp Fiction is certainly a very great movie. And I really like Quentin Tarantino too, but he's one of these directors that has sort of a cult following. The people that really like him are devoted to him. Anytime a movie or news of a movie comes out, they're the first in line to get a ticket. They see everything he does. And I certainly understand because he is a very unique filmmaker. His movies really stand out from the other stuff that's out there these days. Yeah, man. I, I mean, and he said he's going to stop at 10, I believe was like, and so you think he has one or two more after that. I, I, you know, that would suck because I love, I love Tarantino. I love his dialogue. I think the guy writes some of the best dialogue ever. I, I, uh, I like that. He just started in a video store. One of our mutual friends, um, he worked in a video store. So I always think of him when I think about Tarantino because of that video store origins. Yeah. So let's see if he keeps to that, if he stops at 10 movies or if he does stop at that as a director, if he's involved as a producer on more projects after that, who knows? I like to think that his future with movies is in set in stone and done after 10 but we'll see. And I certainly hope his fans will kind of encourage him to keep making films as well. So certainly an interesting visionary director. I certainly love Pulp Fiction as well. So we'll see what the future holds for him. Yeah, man. So let's see. You went crown based. So I thought about crown based. I, I, I thought I was like, but we'll see. So what movie did you go with? So this is another kind of classic movie that I don't believe we've covered on the show yet. And I picked the movie related to this, this crown theme with these crown-shaped chicken nuggets, The Princess Bride. And this is another classic that, this is almost kind of like a Mean Girls, where we talked about that uh, last episode or the one before that, where this is just a movie that appeals to everybody. And much like the young kid in the movie, in the story, of who's being read this, this fairy tale, that he seems so against it at first, but by the end of the movie, he's really into the story, so... This is kind of like that, this movie where it just appeals to everybody, even if the concept doesn't sound at first like you would enjoy it. Eventually, when people see this movie for the first time or they see more of it, they like it. It's a, it's a classic. Yeah, dude. Princess Bride is a classic. I absolutely love the movie. I mean, Inigo Montoyo. Yeah, Inigo Montoyo. You know, you killed my father, prepare to die. It's like one of the most famous phrases ever in movie history. Um I even like, you know, Deadpool, the PG-13 cut they did a couple of years back, borrowed from the Princess Bride format, where it was Deadpool telling a story to a grown up Fred Savage. And then the movie was the PG-13 Deadpool 2. So it's a movie that's definitely stood the test of time. Absolutely. And like you said, it's, 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 it's insanely quotable, not only for that little repeated line, but inconceivable and as you wish. And there are just a million little lines in there that are just that have stood the test of time and are still quoted to this day and are still kind of spoofed in other things. And it's just a very classic movie and a fun adventure comedy. Again, another one of these movies that kind of blends genres together. So certainly a movie that I still enjoy watching if it's on cable, if I come across it, or I'm looking for something to put on that's familiar on a streaming service or what have you, and just kind of turn that on and watch the Princess Bride, very enjoyable movie. Yeah, and a good companion movie to that is, I don't know if you ever saw My Giant, Billy Crystal, but he wrote that movie based on his work with Andre the Giant in that movie, how Andre the Giant is like was like the nicest, sweetest man in the entire world. So I think it was 94, something around there, he wrote and directed, I believe, the movie called My Giant, which is purely based on his relationship with Andre the Giant from that movie. Yeah, so certainly an enjoyable one and another classic that I still like watching whenever I can catch it. I agree. 
All right, so this is my favorite week of stories because we got two food stories. Um, Not only this, do we have two food stories, but we have a UFO story in there too. I know. This is, this is utopia for me, man. But, um, so this story, I saw the headline um, when I was in – or right before, whenever, I went to a supermarket. And I saw the headline that said that Chick-fil-A was running out of Chick-fil-A sauce. And at the moment I was in the store or something and I saw a row of Chick-fil-A sauces for sale. And I was like, okay, so, you know, so then I was like, okay, conspiracy theory. Chick-fil-A isn't actually out of sauce. They just want you to buy your own. Well, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it's different where you see the bottles of their sauce in the grocery store and you see the sauce packets that they say they're running low on at their actual locations. And I think it certainly has to do with manufacturing and shipping. And it's a much different process than just bottling the sauce in bulk and sending it to stores. And maybe you might see a a shortage in stores soon. So we'll see. I I believe them that there's certainly a a shortage on sauce. Say that five times fast, because we've certainly seen that effect with other products and things and goods and services during the pandemic where the effect of that has really impacted some of these things that we've kind of taken for granted will always be there in terms of products. Yeah. And another part of the story that kind of stuck out to me was that they're going to start limiting their sauce packets to three sauces per 30 count of chicken nugget. Now, I don't know about you, but one sauce packet will not cover 10 nuggets. And that just seems insane. I mean, you have to, now you have to start limiting the dippage. Come on now. Yeah, I think it's a first world problem that we're just going to have to suck it up and deal with for the time being. So again, another food story. So where did you go with a movie related to this? Honestly, I didn't have a movie for this one. I sat there for about 20 minutes looking up any conceivably related story. I looked up if Chick-fil-A had ever appeared in any movies. I did, I couldn't find a single movie that Chick-fil-A appeared in. And so I was like, you know what? The movie's about sauce. I was like, all right, what's sauce? Oh, what do people, when they drink too much, they're on the sauce. So the movie I picked was Beer Fest. Very loose connection, but so is mine. So Beer Fest, what do do you like about this movie? Because I'll be honest, when I saw this for the first time, I didn't really love it. I kind of saw it in college with some friends in one of the people's rooms, and we all just kind of watched it together. And I wasn't really that impressed. I thought it was okay. It was a little bit silly for me, even back then when I was college age. But, you know, what do you like about Beer Fest as a movie? I love Broken Lizard. Uh, even their movie that gets maligned the most, which is Club Dread, I still find fairly funny. So I absolutely love Broken, the Broken Lizard comedy troupe. Uh, and so I, I do very much enjoy Beer Fest. And I hope that they'd make their sequel, uh, Weed Fest, at some point, because I, I would very much like to see it. But I think what happened is a lot of people saw, maybe this was your case, you could clear that up. If A lot of people saw Super Troopers first. And Super Troopers is kind of a, a legendary comedy. It's a classic comedy at this point. So I think a lot of people after seeing Super Troopers were maybe the law of diminishing returns of Broken Lizard where just nothing lived up to the, the high standards set by Super Troopers. And so maybe that affected their enjoyment of Beer Fest and, and all their subsequent movies. And that's certainly a fair theory. But I'll I'll say when I saw Beer Fest for the first time, I went into it with no expectations because I didn't really know the filmmakers. I hadn't really seen or heard too much about it. So I literally went in a blank slate to watch the movie with. And I just didn't really enjoy it. I, I felt like there were some laughs in there. There were some funny parts. But... Overall, I just thought it was eh, it was okay. I was just enjoying the time spent with friends instead of the movie more. So it was interesting. It was a little bit different, a little bit quirky, but not really my cup of tea, to be honest. Right on. Obviously, I, I love it. I think it's a great comedy. So with that said, have you been a fan of any Broken Lizard uh, comedy film or their TV show, um, um, Tacoma FD, which is absolutely hilarious? I think their projects have kind of been in the same vein for me where I've liked them. I've enjoyed them. And I certainly think they have good parts to them, but I wouldn't say I'm a massive fan of their work as a whole. I'm not going to go out of my way to watch it. Or if I flip past it on the TV, that that's going to be the thing I land on, but it's certainly enjoyable. And I certainly appreciate it for their different kind of sense of comedy. 
Right on. So let's let's hear your loose connection to this story. So my loose connection in the story, they mentioned Chick-fil-A's Polynesian sauce. So I just took that and ran with it. And a Polynesian type movie is Moana, Disney movie. So this one, I don't think we've covered on the show yet either. And this one, I tell people what I told people at the time after I saw it, which was, I thought the movie was good, not great, but I thought the soundtrack was great. And I'm sure you could certainly appreciate that because you really like these musical movies and musicals in general. So do you agree with that or not, that the movie itself was good, not great, but the soundtrack was really great? I don't really much remember the movie that well. I've seen it once. Uh, you know, it was it was what well, didn't stick with me. But to your point, uh, I have a thumb drive in my car with music on it, you know, a thousand songs or whatever. And I think two days ago, You're Welcome came on. And I was in my car going, all right, right on. So... I can say the soundtrack is a quality soundtrack. Yeah, it's just it's a soundtrack that you could really enjoy. That's really lighthearted, really enjoyable, really catchy. That has some different kind of songs on it. And obviously the the man behind it was Lin-Manuel Miranda, famously kind of started, not started, but became maybe a household name with Hamilton. And that has since then moved on to a lot of other projects that he's really put a spark into. So this is kind of a, a tie in to a movie coming up called In the Heights, where he's involved with that one, too, where this is almost a little bit of a, a segue to that, where we're talking about In the Heights as well, with Lin-Manuel Miranda talking about Moana here. Yeah, I'll, I'll pivot to In the Heights because I, uh, I cannot wait for that movie. I, I, that is one of the I generally don't watch trailers. I've probably seen the In the Heights trailer, no joke, 50 times. I absolutely love that trailer. The way the music is in that trailer, it is, it is to me a perfect trailer. Sure. And I don't really mind musicals if I watch them. It's not something that I go out of my way to see. But, you know, I'm right there with you where a movie that I'm really anticipating that I'm really looking forward to, I'll go back and I'll watch the trailer 50 times or I'll watch it once a day or, or something just to get myself excited for a movie. And then that's all I'll... I'll that's all that I'll look up about the movie because I don't want things spoiled for me or reading fan theories and becoming disappointed when it's not the case in the actual movie. What I do for an upcoming movie that I really want to want to see and want to enjoy, I just watch the trailer for one trailer, not even the 50 trailers that come out and all these little spots. I watch one trailer and then that's it. And then I'll go see the movie and try to avoid as much as I can. I'm the exact same way. I generally will watch the first trailer they release. And when, you know, some of these movies release five, six trailers, I won't watch them because I don't want to see all that. I want to, I want to get excited off of the one trailer. And then I just want to see the movie. Yep. Even if it's a cool little tiny moment that doesn't affect the plot or the characters that they have in the trailers, I don't want to see that in a trailer. I want to see that on the big screen while I'm watching the movie. So I think we're at least in agreement about that. 100 percent and i assume we'll be covering in the heights when it comes out that'll be a new movie of the week but can't wait for that so a kind of cute funny story that came out during the week in terms of entertainment news was that i think it's 17 years after the movie came out two school of rock co-stars were dating in real life and i believe they were engaged maybe that's maybe that's not the case but the fact is that they're they're with each other, that they're seeing each other, that they're at least dating. And I thought this was just one of those funny, maybe the world kind of brought them back together, or maybe they've just always kept in touch and have just recently kind of become involved with one another. But just this is one of those funny stories about where life can lead you, about your co-star from 17 years ago when they, they were two kids in this movie that they now got back together. Yeah, you sent this story. I clicked it. I read it. When I was finished, I went, cool. So just a funny little interesting story from the past week. So I really hope we're kind of in unison here with picking the movie School of Rock related to this story. Yeah, I can't see how any of, we would pick a, a, any other movie. And School of Rock, you know, this is another enjoyable one where I think if you're a Jack Black fan, this is kind of where he's maybe at one of his best. And there's a, a lot of good young kid actors in this one as well that really kind of 
anchor the movie to and really give him some good material to work off of as this fake teacher that's trying to put together a rock band to win this contest. Yeah, the school of rock. I, I'm a huge Jack Black fan. I tend to enjoy the, the the chunky actors for the most part. There are a couple I don't really like, but Jack Black is one of the ones I absolutely love. Uh, I'm a massive Tenacious D fan. One of the things that sucks about the pandemic was I had tickets to see Tenacious D for the first time ever last year, and the can't, uh, concert got canceled. But uh, yeah, School of Rock I think was like his first big breakout movie because he had been in. He'd been in a lot. He'd been in a movie called Airborne. He'd been in uh, Orange County. But School of Rock was like, I, I believe it was like his first starring role. It came out. It did well. Fin- it did well at the box office. So that was the movie that solidified Jack Black as like A-list talent. Absolutely. But I will say to people who are Jack Black fans to go back and watch his earlier stuff before this if they haven't already because he's still great in these movies that he's kind of worked his way into in the past maybe in the late 90s i think where he's in some some good movies still and really tried to do his thing and kind of steal the show in these movies that he's been in before school of rock so i will say if you're a jack black fan go back and watch some of those as well yeah and i'll give that suggestion for a movie called airborne which is a movie about rollerblading which is like one of my all-time favorite movies and and He's not even a major supporting character. He's a he's a small role. He plays one of the uh, the henchmen to the bully almost, like you know, one of those guys. He's hilarious in the movie, just in a you know maybe ten minutes of screen time, and he steals the movie. It's also got a young Seth Green in it and everything. So School of Rock, there's a lot to like here. I think it's really, I think it's my kind of humor too, with a lot of sarcasm and a lot of dry humor because that's what you get with these kind of preppy preppy uptight school kids kind of working off of this crazy guy who's trying to get them to open up a little bit more and become a little more loose and really express themselves so school of rock i really kind of identify with its humor and it's a movie that i still like watching to this day yeah school of rock i haven't seen it in a while it's been a while since i've seen um it's a good i know they did the broadway play with alex brightman and I haven't seen it. I saw, you know, I've seen the highlights, uh, you know, the Tony Awards stuff and everything. So I, and I love Alex Brightman, though. He played Beetlejuice, which I did see and I absolutely love. So, uh, and you probably know Alex Brightman. He was on Impractical Jokers, the, uh, the, the punishment with Q. Where he I had do. To so we, we both, we both watch Impractical Jokers, the TV show, both really enjoy it. So I do know him from that. But School of Rock, yeah, great movie. I can't wait to go back and watch it maybe after this episode. There you go. All right, so my last story is, uh, you know, normally if you listen or watch this podcast, you know that Mitch and I generally agree to disagree. But one of the few things, one of the things that actually maybe started our friendship when we were when we were working together was that we both loved the original Batman animated series. We're huge fans of that of that series, and so it was announced this week that uh, HBO Max is going to do a brand new animated series, bringing back the creator Bruce Tim from the original animated series, and now adding J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves, who are two phenomenal storytellers, to create something called Batman Cape Crusaders. And so, uh, you know, I just figured this was, you know, you brought a food story for me. I wanted to bring a Batman story, animated story for you. Sure. So I certainly appreciate that. It almost feels weird you introing this type of story instead of me. But I did see this this piece of news that came out during the week. And I will say I'm cautiously excited because we've seen a lot of different Batman iterations over the years. Some have been very successful, like the original animated series from the 1990s that you touched on, and some not so successful. Like in, in my case, I watched this show called Beware the Batman that was a kind of CG animated show iteration of Batman, a cartoon that came out a few years back. And I hated that one. So I'm cautiously optimistic about this because certainly the talent that's listed associated with this, Bruce Timm, who's the original creator of the first animated series, J.J. Abrams, and Matt Reeves, who's directing the upcoming The Batman movie with Robert Pattinson. A lot of good talent there. We'll see if it's maybe too many cooks in the kitchen where if they can get a blending of their different kind of storytelling methods and tones together cohesively. But I'm certainly intrigued and interested to see where they go with this because it looks to be a little bit of a darker kind of iteration, not 
playing to five-year-old kids where maybe people of all ages can enjoy this. And Batman, of course, kind of lends himself to a little bit of a darker tone and more mature aesthetic and storytelling methods. So we'll see where they go. Yeah, I think the fact that it's going to be on HBO Max. So there's another HBO Max, the Harley Quinn series. I haven't seen that series personally. I, I do plan on watching it, but apparently that's like a much darker, more adult take on the Harley Quinn character. Um, have you seen that? It's on my list, and it's a show that I do want to eventually watch, but I've heard nothing good but good things about it, and I'm sure I'll like it as a DC Comics, as a Batman fan, but I haven't quite watched it yet, but I certainly wish to soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely going to get to that because, and, and that's, I, 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 maybe a lot of people don't know, but the Harley Quinn character was created by, I believe it was maybe Bruce Timm or maybe one of the other guys, but originally created for that animated series back in the 90s. And now she's like a massive popular character. That is true. She was an original creation of the original 1990s Batman animated series and has since obviously become a, a huge kind of figure in the Batman franchise for movies tv shows video games that sort of thing so again i like the talent associated with this show so i'm cautiously optimistic about when it'll debut and how it'll look yeah man so getting to the movies i i'd be surprised if we don't have the same movie maybe we don't uh -oh, that sounds like you didn't go traditional because my movie i just went straight out with batman mask of the phantasm because that was we did or we didn't we absolutely we did. did. Okay. Because that's the animated movie that went, it was, it went theatrical and everything. And it was, and it's, I absolutely love that movie. I could watch that movie, you know, once a year. It's such a great movie. It's for Mark Hamill, you know, Luke Skywalker is, is the voice of, of the Joker and he, one of the best Jokers ever, I think. And it's such a, it's just a great movie. So the reason I picked this one to give people a little bit more background who may not know, Batman Mask of the Phantasm was the only theatrically released movie that branched off of the original 1990s animated Batman series. So this got a short theatrical release. So technically it's a, a theatrical release movie. And you're right. This is one where I could watch it over and over again. In fact, I lied about watching School of Rock after this taping. I'm going to go watch that movie after we're done here. So I absolutely love Batman Mask of the Phantasm. I'm really surprised and kind of a little shocked that they didn't incorporate this villain into more of the Batman media after this. Because I think if you look at the design of the Phantasm, the villain from this Batman movie, this animated Batman movie that... It's fantastic. It's it's intimidating, scary, kind of like a foil to Batman. And this is a very this is a more mature storytelling than the show. And the show is pretty mature. It doesn't really talk down to kids or really kind of play to, you know, really simple ideas. But this goes a little bit more mature than the show where it has some adult themes and acting and things like that. So this is a movie I really enjoy. Oh, yeah. I'd be surprised, man, if one day we don't see a Phantasm live action villain brought in or something. I, I, I could see it because the costume design for that would be gnarly. I just, I think one day, eventually, they're going to reboot the franchise enough times that eventually they're going to be like, uh, all right, let's do Phantasm this time. Exactly. Whenever they come out with new Batman movies, they're always looking for new villains that audiences haven't heard of yet or recycling some other ones. So. Eventually, we have to get there. And you know what? With Bruce Timm involved with this Batman Cape Crusader show coming out, maybe we'll see a Phantasm pop up in that iteration. So we'll see. I really love that movie. Yeah, dude. That would be pretty uh, pretty rad. I'm, I'm excited for it. I didn't, like you said, you watched Batman, the whatever it was called. I didn't stick with all the million animated shows that have come out since that original animated series because there's just too many to keep track of. That's fair, and some have been better than others. I'm not going to recommend all the ones you should watch or don't watch. I'll let you kind of figure that out because, again, there's so many of them, and we could talk about that for a while. But Batman the Animated Series from the 1990s is at the top for me in terms of Batman TV shows. 
So in keeping with our theme of a movie of the week here to talk about from previous weeks where we're talking about a movie related to one coming out soon. So this week we're going to be talking about A Quiet Place. Obviously the sequel is coming out soon and like I mentioned on a previous episode, we're going to look at these on a case-by-case basis to say, are we going to go see these in theaters, some of these new movies that are now theatrical exclusives? Or do we not feel comfortable enough quite yet to go to a theater to see some of these or we're not passionate enough about them that it's going to drag us out to a theater? So for me, I'm not going to go see A Quiet Place Part 2 in theaters. I'll probably catch it on home video or when it comes out on a streaming service or some such like that. So instead, we'll kind of talk about the, the first one here. But are you planning on maybe seeing this second one in theaters? I am uh, I am very torn on these decisions. Uh, I very, 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 very much want to go to the theaters to see A Quiet Place too. Um, but with recent events and uh, masks not being as prevalent in in uh, you know society as they were just a week ago, I am not entirely sure I will be heading back to the theaters anytime soon. So what did you think of when you first saw A Quiet Place? Because what expectations did you have going in? Because I didn't really know what to expect or if it was going to be a good effort from John Krasinski as a director, or if this was, there were rumors at the time that this was going to be a secret Cloverfield movie, that it was going to connect to that franchise. So what did you kind of think going in to see this movie? And what did you think after you had seen it? For one, I remembered that, but not until you just said it. I, I remember that there was Cloverfield talk about that. I, I, but um, I remember the original trailers for it, man. And it was the original trailer was quiet, you know, quiet, obviously. And thinking like, OK, this is this is interesting. This looks like maybe a, a, a 50 million dollar grocer, you know, a decent hit. And then it came out. Reviews came out, said it was absolutely phenomenal. And so this was one I actually waited to see in theaters because I wanted to see it in the theater where I knew not a lot of people were going to be. Because uh, I knew if I heard somebody talking during this movie, my pack of milk duds would just be unloaded on that person. And uh, I went to the Dolby Cinema that they have at AMC because those are the best sound. And, and contrary, you know, a silent movie kind of like that, you want the best sound. I know it sounds weird. But a silent movie where the sound is so important, you want the best sound. And so I paid the extra money, saw the saw the movie, I think, on a Tuesday during the day where I knew not a lot of people would be there. And I I absolutely loved it, dude. I, I, won, I thought it was one of the best horror movies I had seen in a while. Yeah, a lot of people really enjoyed it. And it was certainly an original concept. And I got to give props to the movie for that because I was certainly intrigued by the trailers when I first saw them. And when I went to go see it, I went in expecting these jump scares that unfortunately have infiltrated the horror genre recently where you have complete silence and then something pops out with a loud noise and people say that's how you make a good scary movie. And it's not. that That's cheap. Anybody can do that. You can make a scary movie just by throwing those things in there and it doesn't make for a good scary movie. So... I'll be honest, with the premise of this movie going in, I was expecting a lot of those. I was expecting this to just be another jump scare fest where they were just going to use the premise to do a lot of those. And don't get me wrong, there are some of those in there because the reason it's called A Quiet Place and it's so quiet in the movie is because the creatures hear by sound. They pick up sound really easily. So to be fair, they really use that premise really creatively and effectively in the movie. And they did have some interesting scenarios and some tension and scares that weren't just something popping out with a loud noise, like a jack in the box. So I will give the movie props for that. Yeah, dude. And with John Krasinski, and I think a lot of people, when they saw that he was directing this, I I know a lot of people probably thought that this was his directorial debut. But, um, you know, I had actually seen his, his previous films. They were more independent films. He had had directed a movie called Brief Interviews with Hideous Men, which I don't remember too much about right now. But I remember seeing it and thinking that was like it was a really weird, offbeat kind of independent movie. And like, okay, that's an interesting movie. And then his next movie was something called The Hollers, 
with Anna Kendrick. Obviously, that's why I saw it. Anna Kendrick. I'm gonna see anything with Anna Kendrick. And that was more of like your dramedy, where a guy comes home be, to take care of his ailing mother, and he's he's got a fiance, but his old school, you know, his old crush is there, and it's like a romantic dramedy. So going into this movie, I was like, I was like, I think Krasinski can handle this because I had seen his other movies, and they were they were they were paced, which is the director's job pretty much editor and director is to pace the movie perfectly and with his other two movies i had seen i knew that the guy could handle it but this was his first big movie and so you even going into you're like like you said is he going to fall into those horror movie tropes of jump scares and garbage like that and i was like no he it felt almost more like an independent kind of horror movie where it didn't play into those stupid things it it it, it allowed the it, it treated the audience intelligently yeah, we've talked about this on a previous episode where actors that have become directors or producers or tried their hand at filmmaking, and I'm always willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm always willing to see what they can do, to at least go and watch these movies that have been directed by former actors or people who still act. And especially in horror, you're seeing more of this too, where in the same vein as Jordan Peele, where he was an actor who is now making horror movies and doing it superbly. So I'm always willing to at least see their efforts and at least see what they have kind of come out with and their ideas. So, and this was one I think certainly hit, hit the mark and I'll be looking forward to when I can, whenever that may be checking out a quiet place part two. Yeah. I mean, even just this week, we saw a couple of reviews start trickling in for part two. And from what I've seen, they're all super positive. So I am very much looking forward to it. Absolutely. So eventually when we are able to individually check this movie out, that we'll certainly cover it on the show or we'll certainly let each other know what we think. So A Quiet Place, I think a very good original horror movie. And I hope the sequel kind of lives up to it as well. Agreed. So thank you to everybody for tuning in for another episode of our Life Imitating Movies podcast weekly show where we cover news stories, the lighter side of news, because everyone could use a little bit more of that and the movies that we think relate to these weekly stories. So thank you to everybody for tuning in, whether you're watching, listening, we're on Spotify and iTunes for the audio versions. And then obviously if you're watching this, you're watching it on YouTube as well. So feel free to search life imitating movies on whatever platform you get your podcast from. And there you can find us. So Brad, anything you want to close out the episode with here? Uh, no, I don't really have anything to add to that. We'll see what happens next week. Some more stories, some more good quality stories for next week. Absolutely. So hopefully we introduced you to some good new recommendations, movies you haven't seen or heard of, or stories that you haven't heard of during the past week. So thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll be back again Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern with a new episode of Life Imitating Movies. Later. <laughs>